Entrepreneurship can be a lonely road to travel despite choosing a path that allows you to build wealth and make a real impact. It often feels like you are on this journey all by yourself. The desire to work from anywhere is fantastic, but you also yearn for a community of like-minded. You crave the chance to exchange ideas, learn from others facing similar challenges, collaborate and forge new connections in the business world. Your friends and family may love and support you, but they don't really understand what you're going through. They are content with their 9 to 5 jobs, leaving you with no one to talk to about your entrepreneurial dreams. If only there were a community of fellow entrepreneurs, a place where you could find advice and support from those who truly get it. Imagine this, an oasis of for entrepreneurs where you can quench your thirst for connection and fuel your ambition to succeed. Business Grid Insider is the community you've been waiting for. It's designed exclusively for entrepreneurs, founders, consultants, and freelancers like yourself. Here you can find a tribe of like-minded individuals ready to uplift, inspire, and help you overcome the challenges that come with building your empire. Expand your business network and explore new partnerships and collaboration opportunities. Enjoy exclusive resources, webinars, and workshops designed to enhance your entrepreneurial skills. Join Business Credit Insider today and unlock a world of support, knowledge, and opportunities to propel your entrepreneurial success to new height. Head to tiny.cc slash businesscreedinsider. Welcome to this episode of Best Talk with Tanya and it is so good to be back and have you here. So on this episode, we are going to be discussing leadership. This is a recording of a workshop that I held for my community where we had a leadership coach come and speak to us about managing and leading high performance teams. And this is, this was so amazing because if you know me, you know that I am trying to scale a business, I am trying to grow a business, and I'm trying to prep my business to eventually sell it in the long term in a couple of years. So one of those things that is needed to make sure that your business is sellable when the time comes is actually having a team. And in order for you to have a team, you need to be able to manage and lead them effectively so that when the time comes, you can transition out of your business and your business has these people to continue running it and continue operating in it. So this was such an amazing conversation. Um, you'll hear the workshop, watch it if you're watching on YouTube. And if you are new here, subscribe, let me know in the comments or send me a message via Spotify on what you thought of this episode. And also, please can you subscribe or share with somebody that helps us so much to grow and also leave a review or a yeah leave a review or rate the podcast on Spotify on Spotify this would mean the world to me dm me with your it was your screenshot i'll be so happy to chat with you and, it, and hear your feedback don't forget to check out the, the description box for how to join our private community as well as to check out the revenue master the revenue acceleration masterclass, which is a walkthrough of our infusion selling approach that helps us find clients on social media and turn social media into a client acquisition machine. And this will actually give you insight on what you ought to do and how you ought to approach marketing and what you need to put in place to ensure that your marketing starts operating effectively. So if you want that, I'll leave the link to access that below. On this note, let's jump in and enjoy this episode. This is Best Talk with Tanya, brought to you by West Digital Academy, a show for business athletes and online bosses who are ready to take up. And welcome. You can all hear me. Yes, welcome to all of you. Wonderful that you're here with me. And, um, but perhaps am I speaker? Is this the correct? Do you see me all clearly? Francesco, yes. Okay, wonderful. So, gosh, just a little bit of a story on me, um, but not really, mainly on the business side. I started to trade, uh, I did finance with ABN and AMRO Bank, a, a corporate global bank, and I uh, traded it. Italian government bonds, as well as emerging market bonds. So 
I was exposed to a corporate team structure. And those were, I did that for five years. Then I decided that I wanted a bit of a change of scenery and I moved into fashion where I worked in a family owned business. And I was head of sales, but the team was much smaller. So I was exposed to a smaller team. And then after fashion, I had my biggest growth because my husband and I decided to buy a little hotel in the south of France. And uh, we actually demolished it and rebuilt a new one. And then we had to run it. So this is where I really got into how to lead a team because I was responsible for the beach, the beach restaurant and the whole beach, which could, uh, oh, sorry, I've just seen someone else enter the room. So I really had to get into how am I going to lead my team? What am I going to put into action? Because here I was not really the, let's say, uh, employee or the manager. I was the founder and the director. So this is where I learned a lot. And um, it's enabled me to set up today what I have in store for you. Okay, so today we're going to discuss what a high performance team needs to look at. How can we develop that? Okay, and there are a few things that we've got to look into. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Hello, Axel. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Great, thank you for being there. Okay, so share screen, share screen. Okay, there we go. So the topic for today, how to manage and lead high performance teams. Now, Oh, wait, I have to be able to. You may all be here because you're a business leader or an owner or even the head of a department, a manager, or you just want to maybe start your own business. So you're in the right place if you feel quite frustrated because you're constantly chasing after your team. It's kind of, you're not getting them to perform at their best and perhaps you're a bit of a control freak could be okay think about all that i'm saying um reflect reflect on my words i would love it if you could also note down some things that um you resonate with as i speak okay and you're also in the right place if you're maybe struggling to communicate with each member of your team you're in the right place if you feel like you have to save the day every day and you're being spread thin and you're in the right place as a business leader and owner if you feel like you don't have the trust of your team so you're always kind of looking over your shoulder and you're here in the right place if you feel like and this is one of the biggest issues that um, my clients have and that i had i have to resolve every person's individual problems and it's just too much you're also in the right place if you're experiencing high employee turnover rates now you may have tried providing feedback to your team members but perhaps that wasn't effective or you even tried to do ad hoc training uh, to develop your team members and I'm going to explain to you why perhaps this didn't work we're going to look at it eh, as we go through the um, the slides, you may have even tried to focus only on results, end goal in mind, and you didn't really focus too much on the process or on building relationships. Perhaps you tried to ignore problems and thought, well, look, they'll resolve themselves or conflicts. And you may have even tried to micromanage. Now, micromanaging leads to burnout and a lot of difficulties and usually i find that micromanaging happens out of fear out of being insecure and out of fear of being judged so often you will find that middle managers feel that if they do not make sure that the work is perfect 
they will be judged by their executives, superiors. And the executives feel that if they don't do their work perfectly or so they will always want to jump in and make sure that, you know, their subordinate did the job correctly, they will be judged by the board or by the stakeholders. So it's such a delicate situation. And I thoroughly understand it's all these issues that lead to us having to become aware of what are the behaviors we're putting into place? What are beliefs that we may have come to believe over the years, but that seem not to be serving us? And there are a few of them that I'm just gonna mention here. So again, your little notebook, wonderful. Just write down any beliefs that are not serving you. Okay, so perhaps you believe, look, I don't have time for soft skills. I am only interested in technical competence, okay? It's, it's just, I've studied, I've done everything, I've got experience, technical competence. Perhaps you also believe that you really have to do everything yourself. Or you believe that it's not your job to develop your team, okay? That people can develop themselves and do their own personal development journey. You may even believe you really need to always be available. Okay, 24 seven. You may even believe that the team should figure things out on their own, a kind of a laissez faire kind of uh, leadership style. You may believe that you need to be tough to be respected, that famous culture of fear. And we're gonna look at a company who ruled their, their business with fear. You may even believe my, my team should just do what I say, because I'm the boss, I'm the leader, do what I say, okay? And you may even believe that you're the only one who knows how to do this. So perhaps reflecting, just if any of these resonate, write them down. And I'll show you now slowly how together we can fix it, okay? And that's what I'm here for tonight. Now, just a quick disclaimer, uh, I, I haven't got time to go through everything today. Okay, so um, please uh, message me um, for a complimentary session. Feel free to re reach out, LinkedIn, in whenever you would like. And so now, this is the most important. In order to better lead a team, it starts with self-leadership. It comes from you. It starts inwardly and then moves externally. So let's define leadership. What does leadership actually mean? To lead is a skill of influence. And it's probably the most important skill you ever have to learn because it allows you also to lead your life on your terms. It's so, so important. So this is what a leader needs, the ability to influence people. Now, as I mentioned already, sometimes we have fear, we have insecurities, I can't do this. Maybe I'm not even a leader. You know, maybe I can't, I'm just not born a leader. And so my next slide is for you. Oh, what is it? There we go. Are leaders born or made? And that's a big question. And actually, <laughs> I looked into a whole lot of research and I found a, a research from Warren Bennis, who uh, was an American organizational consultant, uh, really a pioneer in the field of leadership. Uh, he did die in 2014, but he interviewed all the great leaders and they all agreed that leaders, I mean, you can answer in the chat before I say the answer, if anybody wants to. <laughs> Are leaders born or made? Okay, I'll just go forward, then we'll see. Leaders are made, that's it. Leaders are made. And that's amazing. We can all be leaders. They are made through self-transformation and continuous learning. So those leaders who stop learning, you know, the ones who say, look, I know everything. I don't need to learn. Those are the ones who are known as brutal bosses. Those are the leaders 
that start to get the CEO disease. Yes, can you believe it? The CEO disease. Because they have a fixed mindset. They are thinking, I don't need to learn. I've done everything. And it's because of their ego. They have this ego that is like enormous, okay? And it's a warning sign. Because when you have a big ego, it's actually out of fear. Out of fear that someone's going to maybe kick you out of your position. So instead, Warren Bennis and these other leaders that he interviewed found that to be a leader, you have to be a student, okay? Someone who doesn't think himself an expert, but really thinks of himself as someone who is always learning and is always trying to do that famous constant and never-ending improvement, the Kaizen. So now, why the leader needs to start with the leadership, with self-leadership, because he first has to set himself up for success to then set the team up for success. And the great news is we can all become leaders, okay? And so let me explain the next slide. I, I'm gonna do this slide with an example. I had a, a client who was a training manager for a, a global company and he was really doing well. You know, he was getting pay rises. He was even winning awards, but he would not get the promotion. And so he went to his manager and he said, manager, I don't know why. I'm so good. You're always giving me a raise. You're rewarding me, but you are not giving me a promotion. What is why? And um, the manager said, well, it's because you do not have executive presence. And he said, oh, executive presence. What does that mean? You know, he was a bit confused, executive presence. And he said, yes. So let me explain. Executive presence means exactly as it says, presence. To be, what does it mean? To be present. That means that my entire thought and attention is towards you. I, as a leader, am really taking into account what you are thinking, okay? I am making that experience for you. I am thinking this through for you. And so it's the ability of the leader to develop that that leadership language that is able to foster a trust-based relationship with his team, to foster charisma, okay? Also to foster um, the ability to keep his team calm, to show them direction. So it starts with your being. And now another interesting, interesting fact is that up to middle management, technical competence, is the one that rules. And it is about 80%, 90% of what you need is your knowledge, ability, and skills. But once you move above middle management, 85% of people skills are required, soft skills. And this was done by a study by Harvard, uh, Stanford, and one more, Carnegie Institution. They found 85% of people skills were required for you to be successful as a leader. So people skills, soft skills are required. And it begins with your being, with your internal leadership, with your ability to say, look, I can do this and we can do it together. And I'm gonna lead you and show you how, okay? So this is what executive presence is. Ah, one other fact I wanted to say is that sometimes people become executives without even having experience, like Mark Zuckerberg. He became the head of a global multi-billion company without having really executive experience. But he was able to create the experience for his people around him that enabled the company to get where it got. Now, what makes some companies more innovative? What makes some teams more productive? What makes 
some teams more successful than others? And this is a big question. We all would love to answer this. So there are usually two areas when people come to answer these questions. And one is no problem, Natasha, just hire an expert, hire talent. That's it, just get talent. Well, actually, there are two difficulties here in hiring talent because firstly, talent is not so easily available. It's not easy. And I found that in the hotel, it was hard to always find the right chef or the right waiter. Or it wasn't easy. So talent is not always available. And secondly, very important, you may have seen in any of your teams, but even sports teams, if you take a talent from somewhere and put it in your team, often research has shown that the team does, doesn't perform well. The team actually performs worse. And the reason for this is that talent is not portable. Turning talent into performance actually depends incredibly on the team. Performance is a team activity. That's how important it is. It's not an individual's activity. So you can hire the best experts, but unless the team is able to work together, you will not have that success. Then oh, I can even go to the next slide because the second thing that one could say is, okay, let's go and do team building activities. Let's take the whole team. Let's go off site. Let's get to know each other. <laughs> let's do the personality tests, the Meyer and Briggs, the skills view test. Ah, and you know what else we can do? We can even do that, the ropes test all together or the trustful test where you fall backwards and, and you hope someone's there, okay? These are the things you can do. And yes, they do work, but only and only if what you've learned on those offsites are brought back. They brought back into the everyday workings of the company. I don't know if you've really got that because team building is a habit of behavior. So if we go on these, let's bond, let's get to know each other. And then you do that one week offsite and you come back and you fall back into your old way of doing things. It doesn't change. And so it actually didn't work. So it's so important. And this is where I bring in a bit of the idea that the subconscious rules 90 to 95% of our actions in a day. And why am I saying that? Because the subconscious is our, our habits, our habits, our emotions, and that's what we fall back onto. And we don't even realize it. We don't realize that we're doing a certain thing. Maybe someone else sees it, but you don't always see it. So it is essential to become aware of falling onto these default programs, okay? If they are not serving you well. And so to build a team of high performance, you really need to make it a habit of behavior. And we have a word for it, it's culture. So looking at culture, there we go. The culture of a company and ultimately its success is set by the leader, by the leader's story, the leader's behavior, the leader's leadership communication. And it's basically, culture is the unconscious behavior of the CEO. So the CEO really has to take into account his identity, what he wants to show the world and how he wants his team to show up to the world. So it's that, it's that walk the talk, you know, like um, what is my vision? Let's do it. The leader also does it. He is, how can I say, it's his presence, his being, that's what counts. And that's what, you know, filters through to the team. It's the ability of the, teeter, tea, of the leader, excuse me, to coax his team, to encourage and to inspire. One of the best ways to inspire are through stories. So speaking to your team and telling them also how you got where you got to. Not only telling them a bit about your fears, about 
what you are, like, uh, the ability for the leader to be a bit more vulnerable. Okay. So now, having understood that, I hope it was clear, okay, because, oh, I didn't mention that the 5% is the, the part where we are conscious, where we actually know what we are doing, but it's only 5% of the day. So do you see how easy it is to fall into bad habits and how we really need to ingrain those behaviors, those habits that will lead your team to success? And today, basically, we're going to look at this culture because culture even if you start a business, okay, you're the entrepreneur or the founder or even a small little business. We will be back shortly with your episode. Right now, let's hear a quick word from today's episode sponsor. Are you looking for a simple way to start making sales? Then you'll want to check out our coaching program, Easy Sales Blueprint. Finally, an easy way to sell your program or service. Discover the simple steps to creating a lucrative coaching or consulting business. The Easy Sales Blueprint gives you a step-by-step -step method to easily make more sales without spending all day on social media, cold outreach, and hitting the door to try a good old-fashioned door-to-door sales system. Apply today by heading to tiny.cc slash get more sales to find out how we can help you achieve online sales success. Are you tired of living paycheck to paycheck? Do you dream of financial freedom? Are you tired of the rat race and would like more time with your loved one and friends, making memories that will last you a lifetime? You may want to download Building a 20 Million Portfolio, How I Created Financial Freedom by Aurelia Amaka, a successful entrepreneur, founder of System IU, and author. So why not give it a try? Download Aurelian's book now and start building your own path to financial freedom by heading to tiny.cc slash freedom B. It's you who will instill the values and all this culture will come from you, okay? And so it's an amazing thing to know. And um, basically the three dimensions that have been shown to actually help all industries, across all industries, that means sport, military uh, endeavors, uh, non-profit organizations, government organizations, private businesses, public businesses, they all have this these three elements that are important these three dimensions which are community or world purpose social purpose if you will psychological safety and common understanding uh, don't worry i'm going to go through all of them i'm going to define them i'm going to tell you why they are important and i'm even going to give you some applications but before we do this i have to show you this fun fact the fantastic New Zealand All Blacks. You've got to read this book because they have a high performance culture. And do you know that they, in a hundred years, they have won 75% of the international matches. So excellent performance. And they, as this says, they can even teach us about the business of life and of work. So have a little read. It's a great, great book. Okay, so let's continue to see the three dimensions. And we start with community and word, world purpose. So this is the extent to which a team members feel that they're making a contribution towards work that benefits others. It's that famous mission statement, the why. But what I want to point on more now is not only the why we do the work. It's for whom, for what, why am I doing this? And it's extremely important because your team wants to know who they are serving. And often they don't know because you have team members who are not in contact with the client. You know, they are in back office, they're behind, they don't see what's happening every day. This is extremely important because they love to feel that they are making a difference in someone's life. And um, uh, one example also, um, I have, uh, I think we even have as one of the guests, someone who is in renewable energy. Well, I had a, another client who really wanted to become the middleman between 
the green energy businesses and the, the individual, the person, the person on the street. And so this was her mission. I'm doing it for them, for these people, so that they can afford to look after their environment. And this gives her such a, uh, a feeling of, I'm serving, I'm contributing, I am giving back. And it is so important for us humans to feel that because we are social beings. We are not here just for ourselves. We are here for the greater community, society, country, world, okay? So that was just one example. What can we do now? What can we actually do to foster this community and world purpose, this, this I want to serve the people? In our team, of course, we want to be able to, to help our team to arrive to feeling the sense of purpose. And so the best way here are some examples you can do is to ask your team members, tell us your story. Tell me how the work you are doing matters to the community. I can tell you that they, they will take a bit of time to answer because sometimes they say, well, uh, okay, I don't know, I suppose, but I'm just doing the accounts. So it's not easy to, to understand how they are benefiting the community. But if you're an accountant, you help by freeing time up for that individual or enabling them to save on their taxes. You're doing something bigger. And so the best thing is ask your team members, but also tell them, tell them the story of your company. What we are doing here is, we wanna serve these people in. Tell them, tell them the story. And the reason is they want to work for a team that tells them that their work matters. Okay. And another thing we can do to show them this is to bring in your best customers. You can actually request that the customers come and ask the customers to explain to your team the value that your team is giving them. And this is great because customers are like, they feel, you know, very happy that you've invited them to the company. That's also a way of marketing your company. And they also feel valued, the customers, but your team learns who and for whom and for what they are doing their precious work for. Okay, so this is a great little thing you can do. You can do it quarterly maybe, or yeah, as you wish, timing is up to you, but this is a great thing. Before I come, oh, then the last, make sure you're sharing progress. The people want to know where they are going. And I have found, especially in the big corporations, that they don't know what the company is doing, where the company is going. People want to feel that they are part of something that's moving forward. And the reason for this is because it motivates them. People want to feel that they are producing, going forward, achieving that goal. And so you've got to communicate. As a leader, you've got to communicate to them. Share the progress that your company is doing. So share this progress with them. And also tell them we are here for this reason, to help these people. And thank them also for the valued work that they are doing. So this is how we build that sense of world purpose, or community purpose in your team. Okay, let's go on to the next one. The second is psychological safety. And this is an academic term, okay, for culture, how to develop a very high performing culture you need to enable team members to feel safe safe to express themselves, to take risks and be able to speak up even when they disagree with the superiors. A great, this is a great story. Amy Edmondson did research in a hospital and it's amazing what she found out. She found out that on the teams where the people felt safe, they reported the mistakes they made, okay? But on the teams that they didn't feel safe, they did not report. But can you imagine you're in a hospital 
And I don't know, the nurse or the doctor makes a mistake and they don't report it for fear. Fear they'll be reprimanded, fear that they will be fired. So you see, it is only on safe teams that people can really grow and learn and develop. So this is such a vital aspect of your company. And I have another example, a great example, Ford. Okay. After William Ford, who was the last member of the Ford family uh, to be a CEO, quit. Alan Mulally actually became CEO and he was the ex-Boeing CEO. And he came, came on to save a company that was now losing in 2006, was losing 17 billion a year. So it was like, oh, okay. And he had to come in and turn this company around. So he decided to invite all his senior leadership and we have this business process review. And he said to the senior leadership, now when you show me your presentations, all of you that have a problem, I want you to put a red color. He actually used colors, can you imagine? He said, put a red color if you have a problem. If everything is going well, put green. For eight weeks, I, I, I don't know, I'm sure you can guess, they all put green, green, green. Eight weeks, no one dared putting a red until finally Mark Fields, who was um, uh, the executive of the Canadian branch, production branch, had a problem. And he said, he put red, okay? And I tell you, the faces of all the other colleagues went like white, bland. They said, oh my God, Mark is going to be fired. And so they were really like worried. Instead, Ellen, took Mark and put him next to him. And he said, well done, Mark. What's blocking your progress? Tell me what's going on. How can we resolve it? Because if you don't tell me the problems, we cannot get out of the 17 billion loss. And so Mark told him the problems, they resolved it. And slowly, slowly, the company uh, made fortunes after that. So Alan Mulally was able to turn the company around. So you see, he gave them a, a space to speak up such an important thing, a safe space. Create that safe space in your company for your uh, team members. And you will see that you will, you will be able to resolve problems before they're too late. And so here is actually some ways you can deal with psychological safety. Treat conflict with collaboration. Yes, this is not easy, especially in a leadership role. Somebody comes and disagrees with you. And it happened to me at the hotel. It's like, are you disagreeing with me? Okay, okay. I had to really shift my mindset. I had to say, no, Natasha, he's seeing it in a different way. We are all different. He's looking at it from a different perspective. Okay, so rather collaborate. See this conflict as a collaboration. Okay, and Kristen Befar also did a study. She found out that there are some teams highly successful, but that they have a lot of conflict. But they were successful because they were able to separate. They were able to separate this idea behind the disagreement from the actual disagreement, not focusing that it was a disagreement. And criticisms are to be desired. Please don't take me wrong. I'm talking about constructive dis uh, criticism. I'm not talking about destructive or sabotage. Okay, that does happen. We can get employees uh, that can really sabotage a company, but I'm now talking constructive criticism. Okay. And she also found, Christine um, Befar, that sometimes in your team you may have a member who is uh, criticizing, not, not criticizing, but saying, no, but that won't work. Oh, but you should try it this way. But what about that way? And they could be a disruptive member. The way to deal with these people is to say, no problem. Let me give you your department, which is called the critic department. So whatever production finishes with, you are going to have that final say to say yes. This is 100% correct or no, something has to be corrected. 
And you know who did this? Walt Disney. Yes, the Walt Disney. He actually developed a strategy that was so successful. And he had three departments. And the first department was the dreamer department. And in fact, they even, you know, sat with their bodies like dreamers. You can, I can show you pictures where they would sit and dream up ideas, looking up. And that was the dreaming department. But from the dreaming department, you had to put it into action. You had to get the film done. So he then had his realist department who did all the processing, the scheduling, etc. And then he had the critic department. And the critic was looking like this. This is the kind of picture you'll see. And the critic would obviously give his opinion. Yes, this film is perfect. No, this has to be adjusted. And so um, they then went back to the realist department, fixed it up, went back to the critic. When the critic said it's perfect, they launched it. So please remember that differences are to be desired. Okay. Uh, another quick example. Oh, I don't want, I'm going to talk too much. And um, they did that experiment with the disruptive employee in a telecoms company and the errors went to zero. Okay, so take that into account. Second, celebrate failures. With this, I don't mean, oh, well done, well done, you made such a mistake, now we're gonna lose billions. What have you done, well done? No, <laughs> we have to look at failure as win and learn and not win and fail. Easily said, but difficult to do. And it's, it's the idea that we have transparency to say, I made a mess. I messed up. I made a mistake. I made an assumption. We are not perfect. We cannot always be on the ball and know exactly what to do. So, for instance, oh, uh, my, my chefs would say, we made a mistake. We ordered too much. Some of the food has just gone bad. It's waste and it's a loss. But they, it, there was no chance. They had the transparency and they told me. Otherwise, they could have hidden it and I would never have known. Okay, so I had to create at the hotel the safe space for them to tell me these issues. And then we, we, we learned how to develop a system that would take care. Let's say the weather was bad. And instead of having the 300 people for that weekend, no one was going to come. What would we do? And we developed a system to deal with that. So be willing to really learn from errors. And it's only the very arrogant people who just think they cannot learn, that just won't learn. And, and that's detrimental to the company. Okay, so celebrate failures in front of everybody. Oh, look, this is what happened, but no problem. Let's find a solution. Number three, encourage disagreements or differences in opinion. Encourage them. And what I mean by this is, let's say you're having a meeting and often everybody is so rushed the meeting finishes at 6 59 one minute left and the leader or the executive says thoughts one minute to say it in no give your team time let them be able to answer your question okay team this is it am i missing something do you see something that I can't see because we all have different perspectives, biases. Let me know. Okay. And this, I promise you, will bring you into robust discussions, but it will allow your team to grow and to be able to say their part and to feel like they're also taking a part in the growth of your company. Alfred Sloan, CEO of General Motors, would say, gentlemen, I see we have all agreed. Let's meet next week after you've all developed your disagreements. He really wanted them to disagree, okay? So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, incentivate with recognition and reward. Yes, definitely financial incentives, but also recognition that the person is doing something like perhaps um, helping their team member recognize them in public say thank you well done i appreciate that in public in front of the other team members because that's the way the team learns this habit this way of being do you understand that we need to ingrain all of this into the subconscious so that it becomes 
automatic behavior. And that's what really makes the team successful. Should you want to, and need to have perhaps reprimand someone, best to do it in private and use that assertive nature, the assertive communication, which is a way of saying, well, look, I saw you made this error. How can we improve it? Okay. But not in public. Okay. Don't criticize in public. Now, the final one. Ah, the final is common and shared understanding. So, this is an interesting aspect, and it's also an academic term. And here we have Martine Haas. She works, she work, she works now at the Lauder Institute in Pennsylvania, and um, she studied organizational behavior at Harvard. She said, teams need, on the one side, clarity, and that's clarity of their goals, clarity of their roles, clarity of the rules, the norms that the company needs. So it's, I know what my role and responsibilities are, I know what yours are, and I know how our roles fit together. Okay, so this is the clarity, but she said there's another half to it. And the other side is empathy. It's I understand more about you than just what your job description is. I understand who you are as a human, your preferences, your strengths and weaknesses. So it's not just dealing with, okay, this is my schedule. That's your schedule. That's how we've got to follow the net chart and all the processes. It's, I know who you are. I know your desires. I know your fears. Okay. And uh, a simple example is when I was working in fashion, my boss would write to me at 11 o'clock at night and she would say, I need to see you. We need to talk. And I'm like, what? Oh my God. What does that mean? She's angry. She's going to fire me. Or, what is it all about? And it took me like three nights of no, no sleep to understand that that's just the way she is. It's her habit. It's her preference. Understanding the person in front of you will enable your team to collaborate, to have this ability to know each other and share common understanding. I have another example, just a more financial one of Anne Mulcahy, who was difficult name, Mulcahy, <laughs> CEO of IBM that was bankrupt in 2000. She turned the company around. Now, another interesting fact is sometimes when companies are really in the doldrums, like bankrupt, or they are extraordinary circumstances like COVID, usually teams actually seem to work better because they fear that they're going to lose their jobs. Okay, so the team all of a sudden wakes up and says, oh God, we better really get together and fix this mess. So it's not always in, uh, you know, in extraordinary circumstances, the team works sometimes better, but it's in the ordinary circumstances, the ordinary daily business that we have to ensure that we really get to know our team. And she did that. She got to know everyone on the team. She was living their, their emotions with them. Okay. And she got rid of elitism. She made sure though, to celebrate their birthdays. They were given the day off. These kind of things are required, okay? So remember that we are human and that we need to have that personal skill, that soft skill, especially if you want to lead a high-performing team. It is so important. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what can we do now? Let me give you some examples to get this uh, common understanding. The first is what um, Alan Mulally of Ford did. He asked them, what's the problem? What's blocking your progress? So you can, actually the best would be to ask your team without even the leader being there. You know, don't be there. Tell the team, I want you on a weekly basis to sit together and to answer these three questions. But sit together, huh? What did I work on yesterday? What am I focused on today? What's blocking my progress? Why must they do this together? Because they can work out loud and they can ask for help. Because again, our fear that we are failing stops us from asking for help. 
But what is the problem then? Uh, you know, you find yourself three weeks later, no, I'm not going to ask for help. I'll manage, I'll manage, I'll do it by myself. I'll manage, I'll manage. Three weeks later, you've given up. You said, please, somebody help me. And then the problem is worse. And, and your leaders for sure will say, why didn't you tell us earlier? We would have saved the company billions. Okay, okay, millions or a few bucks, whatever. But you understand. So allow them to work together. This is what the All Blacks did. The New Zealand All Blacks team, they, you know that the team coached themselves? The coach was there, he coached them, but he made them build such a high culture, the ability for them to say, look, I'm having a problem here. And the other team member would help the team member. It was amazing. So please read that book to understand what I mean here. And so in this way, your team can build responsibility and accountability. Okay, especially if they have a safe space, transparency to admit that something's not working. Okay, very, very important. And then the amazing, easy, obvious, obvious thing. Well, let's all get a, an understanding of each other. Let's go to business, no business lunches. We have a great thing in Italy, me and Francesco, we have the, our aperitivos and we talk about no business. We talk about our personal lives and the children. Take advantage of those moments, but also of buffer or unstructured time at work. So perhaps before your meetings, leave a little a leeway, five, 10 minutes where the people can talk, not like my client who would just close his computer and leave. Give a little time for the people to bond and to talk. So that's another thing they can do. And then the last two, we are almost there, guys, almost over. It's on Mondays, as a leader, ask everybody. And you can do it by email. You can do it however you wish, meeting, not meeting, but ask them, how is everybody's energy level today from one to five? And yes, give the number from one to five. You'll find that some people will say um, five. Okay, great. Maybe they don't want to share. They don't want to say anything, but okay, five. Some people could say two. If it's two or three and below, ask them, what can we do to help? I'm here to support you, especially if you're the leader, because that way that person knows you care. Even if they don't share, they may not tell you, but they know you care. So do your energy checks weekly basis. Why? Because work-life, work-life balance, yeah, uh, that term is a bit difficult because life enters into our work i mean how many of, of you have had the call oh your son your daughter broke their leg you've got to come now it's like okay i'm going okay so really it's not so easy always to just separate the two of them so we want to be part of everybody's lives that's the team life and work together and then finally lead by example i did mention this a little earlier but Leaders can be vulnerable. Yes, we can say, look, I don't know. Because if you are a leader who says and acts as if he knows everything and does everything, the message you are giving to your team is, if you don't know it, you're not going to get ahead. You better know your stuff. Because if you don't, you won't get ahead. And so that is not a conducive to creation, to developing. Okay, so... Be the example. Say, oh, oh, please, can you help me? I need someone to help me here. I don't know the answer. Be vulnerable. Don't have fear of that. Okay? It's the opposite. If you have fear, well, actually, if you have fear, then your worst nightmares become reality. Because, you know, what we think happens. Yes. The mind is so strong. So you've got to give yourself good suggestions and say, well, maybe I don't know it, but I have a team that can support me. I have a great team, the team that you built up, the team that you developed, that is going to really come to your support as well. And so this is how to build a sense of common understanding. And we have reached the end, these three dimensions that really, if you take them into account, psychological safety, 
world purpose, common understanding, they will really lead your team to something that is amazing. And this is what I saw because there is a synergy. The sum of these three are greater than their parts. And this is what is required. This is what gives you that high performance that a team wants. And let me tell you that if you instill this kind of culture, you will attract better people because people want to do work that matters. They want to know that they're working for a team that understands them and tells them you are significant to us. You are so valuable. They want to know this too you are going to get the best ideas because your team feels safe. They can come to you even with the craziest of ideas and they know that they will fit in and that they will be listened to. And three, you will get your people's best effort because they know why they are doing their work, for whom they are doing their work. And that's an amazing motivator. They will be so motivated to go ahead and also to realize, do you want to take the responsibility of being a leader? Cause it's tough. You know, it's like saying, oh, I'm going to make a baby. It's so easy. It takes seven minutes and you know, you have the baby, but it's those 18, 20 years of looking after the child to be a leader. That's what it takes. So one really has to think about that. And yes, some leaders are really bo uh, born in the sense that they have that influence, they have that ability, that resilience. I just never give up. I go for it forever. But really, you can also do it yourself. Okay? So please, do not get in insecurity. I'm not born a leader. No, you, you can be one, even if you're not born a leader. A number of leaders not believe in being vulnerable. Yes. And are those the ones that are the brutal boss? You know, in human nature, sometimes we have our weaknesses, you know. It doesn't mean you have to go out there and display all your emotions. But just to ask, I need help. Can someone help me? Okay. Oh, asking team. This is a great outlook, Kanya. Oh, thank you. Asking team members their understanding on how they fit in the bigger picture helps them to bring them into alignment. Wonderful. With the brand and the business. Absolutely. And then we need to turn the business, yeah, into a community. Treat conflict with collaboration. Yeah, collaboration. Someone disagrees with me. Don't see it as personal. It's not personal unless they want to really sabotage you. But otherwise, it's not personal. They're giving you another perspective. Attendees who couldn't make it. How do you structure a good team? Okay. And how do you recognize that someone isn't good for? These are long questions. We have a present. I forgot to say that I have a gift for all of you. It's actually the challenges of a team um, that will be able to answer this question. But to structure a good team, I can tell you, if you start with the culture and you allow that to infiltrate, this is a great place to begin. This, these three elements, creating safety for people to speak up, taking care of their needs and their understanding, empathy, you know, knowing who they are as people and the purpose for whom are we doing this for. Though that's really a great team, but that's not telling you the structure. So the structure I'll give you in the gift. And yeah, very good question. To recognize that someone isn't good, I'll tell you, we had at the hotel a gentleman working for us who was using the hotel and he was doing his own business in the hotel. It was kind of, and we didn't even know. So sometimes you don't realize. And then time passes and you realize not always easy. Uh, I believe that if the team member, you can give them their chances, you can put them in the critic department, they can be constructive. But if they row against you continuously, you are the captain you are you know shipping that that ship you are running the show and if they constantly row against you perhaps it's better to get rid of the person sometimes it's better to have a, a smaller team than one that is being jeopardized all the time okay 
um, to be a leader is a genetic or can it be taught? Yeah, I believe that it can be taught. I really do believe it can be taught. But then again, you need to really go into how was the person brought up? Because if they had parents or teachers that said, you are a good for nothing, you can do nothing. Look at you. How dumb are you? How is that person going to lead? It, it, so a lot is involved in those first few years. Uh, okay, so um, we have to take that into account. That's why also I, I do, <laughs> I know this sounds quite esoteric, but I also do hypnosis because I want to bypass the critical mind, the logical mind, and I want to get into that unconscious to get rid of those limiting beliefs that people can have, okay, which is no fault of theirs and no fault of the parents. Everybody did the best they can, absolutely. But it's that belief that you have created that then creates you and limits you and stops you from making that one step forward. Okay, so how do startups establish their cultures to allow teams to align behind the business vision? Okay, oh, I think I kind of give yourself, it's you, it's the being, it's the executive, the leader, the founder. Allow your being, your values, what you want your team to do, to behave, how you want them to bring forward your company. So it's really the leader, the leaders, the top, top executives, or the founder. I mean, you can even be a leader of three people. That's amazing. It, it's how you allow yourself to communicate, to instill, encourage, to bring about that, uh, you know, connection and bond. Obviously, with the end goal in mind, the goal of producing that product doing the accounts, Paola, <laughs> yes. Uh, Francesco doing his digital marketing, also with his team. And everybody else, sorry, a few of you I know, not everybody. Okay, I, I finished the ones written here. Are there, if there's anybody else? Hi, Paola, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> hey. I appreciate, I appreciate. We are all done uh, there, sorry. No, thank you, Natasha. Thanks for calling me. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I've always, always. <laughs> okay, keep well. We'll see each other soon. Yeah. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all got some value. And I'm a student as well. I'm learning all the time. And Francesco knows that. <laughs> I'm learning and learning and learning and always trying to find those ways. That's why I believe... If you really want something, ladies and gentlemen, there is no limit. We create our reality and we can get what we want. Don't limit yourselves. Okay, so let's go for it. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I think I think that uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Wow, I've learned a lot. I've learned oh, a lot. Good. Learned a <laughs> I'm going to even um go through the recordings again like this is this was an amazing presentation i hope that everybody i see samuel say that um he has learned something yes uh, so this is i'm really really happy about that very good illustration Thank from you. the Ford corporation yeah that, i love the examples that you brought to the table because it kind of it really allowed us to um picture the thing and actually realize that we can learn a lot from sport teams i've always thought that but i actually had never thought about looking at the rugby team and maybe also the soccer teams of so course. what can you guys especially the gentlemen here because soccer is always the other woman in your relationships so maybe this time you can tell the missus that I'm actually watching soccer because I'm trying to learn something about business. <laughs> about I, I think this would work. <laughs> this okay. would work but that book you. is a great book to read, the, the legacy one, really. So read it, guys. Read it. <laughs> guys and ladies. Simon, yes, the only woman. Samuel, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yes. he understood you. We didn't understand you, but he did. <laughs> African men and oh, soccer is a problem. You, in the minute that they suck it on TV, you can't get them to move. They won't even yeah. move from the couch to the kitchen. They will not. So I think you got that. Uh, yeah, um, 
<laughs> exactly. So yeah, thank you so much. Wait, um, wait, Axel, the... Axel said something. Can I contribute? Of course. Yes, Axel. So what you can, you please go ahead. Feel free. Did you want to say something? Oh, go ahead, everybody. Open your microphone, speak. Yes. Hello. Oh. <laughs> can you hear me? Sorry, yes. I, I have a bad hair day. Um, but what I would like to, to cont contribute uh, to what uh, you already already pr uh, presented, um, you spoke about the Myers-Briggs uh, type yes. indicator, MBTI. So this is a very, very uh, useful uh, tool because it's uh, showing preferences. So it's not judgmental about um, the people who, uh, who are using it. And of course, as a leader, uh, I need to be transparent and should show also to my team what MBTI type I am. And yes. <laughs> raise the question on um, on how to build up a team. Of, of course, if these um, psychological preferences of what I want to be in my working life um, are clear, then as a leader, I should use a person who doesn't want, want to be a an analyst, but who has a high, uh, let's say you use the term also, um, empathy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, adjust my team uh, according, accordingly. No? And of course, uh, as a as leader, I should also uh, re reflect on it and ask, and you mentioned in, uh, in different ways, um, in an open way, on where can I get support for the deficiencies I have on my side? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing, uh, what, what you mentioned was um, on using the term soft skills. I I hate that. I know. I tried to say human skills, personal skills. Yeah. I'm trying to make all these other. <laughs> yeah. Because they are extremely difficult um, uh, uh, en entities and not for everyone uh, easy to, um, uh, uh, to, to learn. Because as you said, we, we are brought up in a certain way and yes. these behaviors that uh, have been taught to us uh, are sometimes difficult to break. Another, exactly. thing, another thing which I would like to add because I work very often with international uh, teams uh, is the issue on intercultural communication and management. Yes. And there also as a le team leader, I should be aware uh, that my team no. Yeah, absolutely. There's a big variation, and um, that, um, um, yeah. Yeah, you actually, I have an example for that. You know, um, Chris Hadfield, he was the astronaut, Canadian astronaut, yeah. and they were Canadians, Americans, and Russians on the team. And he yeah. went. He he went to learn Russian and learn everything he possibly could. Live with them. So absolutely, intercultural knowing all the different cultures is extremely important. Languages, you know. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. No. And again, and again, it shouldn't be seen as a soft skill, but as a personal skill, because we have to respect each other for what, yes. what we are, no? Of course, yeah. absolutely, 100% agree. Uh, yes. Thank you, thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, uh, so great, great uh, points, I mean, Excel, great points. I believe there was somebody else that wanted to speak again. Uh, you have permission to speak. Yeah, can I join in? Yeah, of course. Uh, Tanya, thank you for getting me here. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Natasha, for the session. Uh, the subject of leadership is very interesting and it's been analyzed by different people in a different way for so many reasons. Um, and I always felt like, look, it's, it's one of those things when I was a student and I thought if I would be a teacher, how would I do it? And when you grow up and you're learning and you're going up the ladder chain of, you know, the, the work thing and you either get a good boss or you get a bad boss, but you always have this in my head. If I'm a boss, how am I going to be doing it? Exactly, uh, And a lot of these things, and I think I was the one who asked you about the genetic or the natural because, uh, okay, yes, you have people who are leaders and there are people who stay away from being a leader and rather be the executor, if I want to call it that. Yes. 
empathy. Okay, I'm not going to say soft skills, but a lot <laughs> of these things you mentioned are very inert. You know, I mean, you are either born with them or you're not. Uh, and you either know how to read people or you're not. You're either a narcissist or you're not. I mean, it's very complicated. We live in a world, it's not about different countries, different religion, even an individual living in the same place. We grow up in such different places that either you're selfish or you're not. So you don't know. I mean, the whole thing about being a leader is put yourself in the shoes of the other person before you decide yes. whether it's white or black, yes. whether you take a decision or you form an opinion because people love forming opinions and passing judgments by default. So it's been a very interesting kind of a, a journey for me as well. And I keep saying I, I'm learning. Some wise guy said it online long back. Uh, you don't demand leadership. You kind of evolve into it. And as a leader, they don't work for you. You work for them. Thank now, that's you. a nice thing to Wonderful say. Wonderful way of saying it. Yes. So I, I, it's it's nice to say, but to apply it and to really live it. And I know. It's tough. On that knowledge. Yeah. It, it comes because you're talking to a lot of different people on a little bit, a lot of different mindsets, different ambitions and all. But yeah, I mean, a lot of things come into play and uh, I think it's a learning process. I think that being a parent or I is one of those things and you keep learning how to deal with different people. The last thing I just want to add, sorry, I'm just taking this. No time, problem. Wonderful. Wonderful. I've been a part of a banking corporation and now I'm a part of, I lead an advertising agency. The culture has been embedded within those corporations of sizes of over 100, 500 people, and they behave very differently versus the people that you work with, let's say 65 to 100 people, because um, these 6,500 people know you by name, know you as a person. I don't need to have forced business lunches mm -hmm. with my team. I, I pretty much know, but that was on me to make sure I made the effort of getting to know each and every one of the people that I lead or I work with not on their what they do basis, but literally on the personal basis. So it does, responsibility does lie, you mentioned it, on the head of a person to not depend on those one-off things. If you genuinely show care from any person that is on your group, on your team, be it a person on the front desk, be it the person yes. helping around the office, up until like the person with your CEO, I think if you're legit and genuine and caring about people, checking up on what's going on in their lives, easier to do with 65 people versus of course, with of such a large size. Absolutely. And honestly, I think leadership is a big challenge in those corporations because every person at that top position is literally fighting to save their position, you know? Yeah. Lastly, if you can just... The humanity aspect, because we treat business as business and we separate it from the human aspect of things. Yeah. If you start really looking at people as people, a business as human, it makes your job a lot more simple. I mean, that's what I've just noticed. That, mm. that was my two steps. Like the other than that, yeah, I, thank you so much. Uh, oh, I'm I appreciate it. Great, uh, great points there. Uh, Someone, I actually love... have a question for you. Sure. Because um, you... Obviously, because I know that there's a number of people here that are in, in the startup space, and I know for certain, um, so he, he is underplaying what um, they have done. They've gone mm -hmm. from a really small marketing advertising agency to one of the biggest agencies wow. in the world. Okay, amazing. So he's underplaying that. So um, there are quite a number of people here with a few that are in the startup space. Like if you had to advise them, because I know that a number of the people that wanted to make it, some couldn't make it, are uh, like head of departments or some are, are like in the startup space. What would you tell them? Because that is also one of the biggest things that they have. Because you guys have grown, and you went you went from being the the, sm the small kid in the block to one of the biggest um, in the Middle East. And I believe that some people can draw some lessons from that. How much time do I have? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> try to, to keep it and okay. show that yeah. you can so we can wrap sure, sure. it up. Um, I think it goes back to what Natasha just said, culture. And culture does start from the top leader. Uh, the leader, uh, when you start up anything, uh, when you're trying to grow a unit, a team and people, energy is very contagious, positive or negative. People get inspired. They see your values and how you're approaching things. Every organization claims it has a purpose and a vision. But let's face it, when you go into a startup mode and you're in that first stage, 
it's a very tough first period that you're going to go through and it's very hard to gamble from becoming money oriented revenue oriented into actually going into why you came into this in the first place which is your vision and if you go into a vision mode and if you literally start with the people that you have and you pass on this transparency this camaraderie this family feeling that you're calling this transforms from one to the other and it you'll be surprised how we've managed I mean, it's it's so shocking for us and humbling as well that it came from our leader not from me from someone on the top who came and asked me the same things that natasha said what do you need how can i help you what can we do to make it done and she rolled up her sleeves and got into it when you work for a leader yourself and you try to make sure that i shouldn't let this person down i should keep them on motivated in that sense and not because you're going to get fired because our company was the only company that didn't let go of anyone during covid lockdowns and that was a big message you don't let go of people you yeah. kind of see you that's a trust that only comes from the top yes. and this that's your real and you're not just saying for the heck of it and you're not looking for a financial cut she took some losses major losses but the number of people that rallied behind her and gave in the production during that period was phenomenal so i think it goes back to the leadership back in the sense that how you motivate your people and you really mean it when you're legit and you really mean it not just because you're saying it in a speech for the sake of calming people down but actually translating and showing them that you care it makes a big difference and people work for you the productivity increases loyalty increases turnover goes down and you're a happy organization i think that's the only thing i can say thank you thank you i think people will appreciate that i think that sums it up beautifully beautifully what was what natasha said yeah oh, great great one yeah oh we also i agree 100% with the hotel yeah you know, we also had big losses with covid but we kept every single person and so we managed to survive thank god <laughs> but hectic <laughs> Oh, okay Gr- guys thank you so much um natasha has um of course she's busy you hear she also runs an account but she has she's been kind enough to open up a calendar for complimentary sessions for anybody listening to this the replay or present here for 30 minutes you have 30 minutes of a time undivided attention she will walk you through um how identify what's going on with your leadership skills what is the problem what are the gaps and then from there and see where you can improve and she's been kind enough to offer that to my community and I'm, I'm really grateful for that and she has also put together a gift so you can dm me or dm her i believe she you can dm her as well uh and details are on the banners and reach out to her and a team the team would ha- will have the gift over to you so on this note um please take note of who is in the room connect with one another um connect with Samar connect with Natasha connect with Samuel connect with each other because one of the things i want uh, connect with Anil with Tembekile connect with each other because i believe that this is how we grow relationships are very important um i have the habit of getting on calls with people just to get to know them so try to do that because you never know where that takes you so on this note are we going to wrap it up here if there's no more questions so thank you so much for those that could make it now and thank you for those that are to those that are going to watch this later and thank you natasha for this beautiful presentation it, yeah, it has well, really given me some ideas yes i love this i love doing it uh, that's it good luck to everybody i'm here for all of you and until next time <laughs> Okay everybody bye everybody um I'll co- let's connect with each other and then we'll take we we'll take it from there bye guys okay. have a great day okay bye bye everyone thank you bye, bye. bye. Ciao. Thank grazie you. paola ciao grazie ciao, ciao.